Well, hiya, folks. It looks like we've gone live now on episode 45 of the Brugaders. So uh, tonight, I think we we're going to start off just by talking a little bit about uh, Kickstarter. Um, as you'll know, um, Jeff and I have run Kickstarters just recently for some of our comics to fund our comic production. And we certainly have backed a whole bunch of comics on Kickstarter recently. Camp VA07 from James McCulloch, um, a sort of new take, sci-fi take on the vampire kind of story. Um, and uh, another fairly substantial tome that's just out, uh, the 77, which is a kind of a 2000 AD like uh, anthology comic, mostly sci-fi stuff. Um, it's got lots of big time uh, writers and artists uh, from the sort of 80s comics um, taking part in that. Um, and our guest tonight is Fraser Campbell, who currently has a Kickstarter running for his... Um, Medium length series, uh, <laughs> Alex Automatic. You're on uh, episodes four and five just now, uh, Fraser. That's right, Colin. Yeah, aye, four and five. Sort of, you're know, more or less halfway through the story. So it's been kind of called a psychedelic, um, mind bending spy adventure romp. But tell us a wee bit about Alex Automatic for those of us that, that don't know about it. <laughs> Aye, I think, uh, I, I can't remember who said this, uh, what was it, I think it was my partner, there's a chap on uh, Twitter that I follow called Seth Jacob, he's a uh, comic creator as well, nice lad, uh, and he said something along the lines of, it's uh, it's kind of like six million dollar man meets the prisoner, uh, meets Joe 90, mm. uh, which I think probably sums it up really, uh, it's basically about uh, a, 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 a young British agent uh, who is subjected to uh, experimental processes to expand his abilities, uh, much like much like Joe Ninety was uh, uh, in, in, in the more innocent times of the Jerry Anderson uh, super uh, super marination TV shows, and uh, unfortunately, however, in, in this in this sort of version, uh, the process. Uh, Shatters Alex's mind, uh, leading him to uh, sort of have these delusions that he is actually a, a an animatronic super spy in a seventies TV show. Uh, so uh, his reality can disintegrate into uh, into these delusions at any time, and making him thinking that he's fighting mm. these outlandish villains and and having these exotic adventures. When in actual fact, he's he's just a, a man. Uh, struggling with uh, with his own shattered sort of mind, uh, and the story starts off uh, basically with him being broken out of a secure uh, facility by two journalists who find out about him and think it, think they're getting this uh, fantastic scoop about a secret government experiment, when in fact they realise they're unleashing a man who uh, whose capabilities they've uh, they, you know they, they they haven't they haven't really thought about very very clearly. And it sort of goes from there. Yeah, it's got these kind of dual storylines, hasn't it? Because you've got the the real life agent and this, his story, but then also his delusions as well. And that's kind of taken up more of the the comic series now as as it's progressed. Yeah, I think it sort of started off with uh, more with uh, the you know just obviously mm -hmm. establishing how how Alex sort of sees and experiences the world. And uh, and bringing in some of those some of the kind of fun elements of uh, these sort of exotic adventures that he thinks he's having, uh, but obviously as the story goes on, we're really sort of seeing things from a more realistic perspective. Uh, and uh, as as he you know as he sort of gradually gets better at handling uh, the delusions, uh, which which is kind of like a pendulum. Really, sometimes he does he's doing well with. And his, his mental health is doing well, and sometimes it's not. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can gauge the reality uh, accordingly in terms of the story. So uh, so really the, you know, the the delusions, though, tend to be not completely disassociated from what's actually happening to them. They're mm -hmm. just a, a way he, uh, the way he's seeing what's happening to them. One of my so favourite ones of that, one of my favourite examples of that, Fraser, there's, um, I read issues one and two, um, yesterday, and um, one of my favourite ones is when he is putting a pearl necklace around a, a beautiful lady's head, 
uh, mm-hmm. neck when in actual fact he's he's got like a, one of those horrible cords and he's actually killing her. That was yeah, yeah. Well, this is the thing. There's all these. Uh, yeah, he in his mind he's doing all these kind of suave spy things, like you know, romancing a, a, a young lady or uh, you know, breaking breaking into a, an embassy or something like that. There's a bit where he's like. Uh, He's using a, a torch to to cut a hole in a window when he's actually using a torch to uh, to, to torture somebody, uh, and you know, so it's it's not just uh, to sort of uh, yeah, it's a way of dissociating, uh, disassociating from what he's doing uh, and and from what's happening to him, uh, and for a way, a way a, 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 obviously, it's a kind of a coping mechanism mm-hmm. as well as uh, as well as a and a, a result of the the things that have been done to him. You've got quite a regular team built up here around the comic. You're you're on writing duties. Got James Corcoran mm. on on uh, artwork with David Cooper um, on colours, Colin Bell on letters. How, how did that team come come about? How did you pull them together? Well, really, uh, you know, I, I, if uh, I, you know, if, if everybody is, I mean, obviously, James and I sort of created the character and and created the idea of the series. It's as much James's idea as it is mine, uh, if not more so. He uh, he really had the idea of some sort of an auto- an automaton sort of super spy, uh, you know, some sort of throwback to the Jerry Anderson sort of ITC kind of uh, 60s and 70s TV and it was you know, you know it was my idea to sort of you know try and sort of, uh, bring it up to date with what you know what, what I've done with it uh, but uh, I'm, I, I still can't remember whether or not it was him or I that came up with the actual name I think it was James but I'm not sure uh, but anyway uh, David I've used for more or less almost everything that I've done uh, there was one uh, project that I didn't use them on, uh, but uh, I, and Colin I use whenever uh, he's, uh, he's available, really. Uh, he's not been available for the current one. Uh, so, uh, so I've had to use, uh, as I've had to use, uh, I've had to use uh, Hassan uh, Osmani El Alwi, uh, mm. who's uh, absolutely brilliant. And uh, he stepped in and been, it been fantastic. Uh, and previously, we've had to use Aditya Bidakar as well, uh, because Colin's not been available. But I like to stay, you know, I, as I say, I like to stay loyal uh, to folk. All these people are my mates, so, uh, and, you know, half the fun of making comics is, you know, messing about and, you know, making something fun with your pals. So, uh, as I say, if folk are available and folk have the time to, to work on stuff, then you can, I, I tend to stick with people who, uh, who I know are good. And who I know won't let me down, you know. So, uh, it's been great. Kind of yeah, and exactly. in a way, it's been nice to it's been nice to expand the family, though, you know, and, and you know, use a couple of different people as well uh, on this. Uh, so, uh, you know, so so it's not yeah, but it's not just the same old gang all the time. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good. It's good to work with these guys. They're all they're all they're all top notch people. What's your experiences with Kickstarter? I mean, I know a lot of people who have, uh, you know, ideas of making comics and Jeff here has just launched his first comic and uh, put it out on Kickstarter with a bit of advice from me. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what's your experience as a Kickstarter and you got any tips that you can pass on to, to newbies like Jeff here? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think everybody's. It all depends on what you're what you're making and what you're doing. I suppose. I mean, I can really only talk about my own experiences, which have generally been very good. Uh, I uh, I funded my first comic, uh, Sleeping Dogs, uh, when I first started. So I've made comics years and years ago, but my first sort of serious attempt to make a proper comic, as in you know something that I, I thought would, you know, be worthy of sitting alongside other comics on a on a stand. Uh, was about 2015 when I made Sleeping Dogs, and I'm and I basically paid for that myself, and that was when I found out how, uh, <laughs> you know, how, how crushingly expensive making comics is. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I, you know, I really kind of if I'm if I'm going to do it like that, I basically have to save up for a year and then make a comic. So it's you know, it's, there's going to be like one comic every two years coming out if uh, oh. at, at this rate. So. Uh, 
because I was a bit reticent about using Kickstarter, as you know, as I think a lot of people are, you know, using new, using new, uh, new shiny things. You know, you get you're a bit wary of these things, uh, and uh, and certainly I was, but it was just a question of necessity, really, going on Kickstarter for the first Alex Automatic, and uh, what I what I did, I think, well on that was that I made sure that I you know, a lot that everybody I knew. That liked comics knew it was coming, so I made sure that I was on Twitter a lot, uh, you know, nipping folks' ears about it on Facebook and stuff like that, and I know, and you know, doing like sort of interviews like this and getting, you know, get getting stuff sent out for advance review, and making sure there was a little bit of a buzz about it before it happened. You know, just would just be things like dropping, uh, you know, dropping artwork and stuff like that, in progress artwork while it's ongoing and stuff like that. And, and just coming up with a wee bit of a, uh, you know, with a wee bit of a plan for how to promote it. Uh, and then when it launched, thankfully, you know, people had got the message and, and it got funded quite quickly. Uh, I still don't really know how to do, how to deal with a, with a slump where they, you know, they, are, they always seem to get a wee bit of attention when you launch your uh, Kickstarter and then it just all completely disappears. Uh, to the point where now I've done a couple of uh, campaigns that have only been two weeks uh, rather than 30 day campaigns. Uh, sometimes you just go for the 30 day campaign because that's what you've always done. Uh, and I think probably from now on I'll probably just do the two week campaign because that, that you know there is a there is a big spell. Where it doesn't really matter how much you promote. In fact, I think you maybe start annoying. Well, I do. I think I maybe start annoying people uh, a wee bit by how much promotion that I'm doing. Uh, so we're doing things like art contests, putting on new rewards, uh, and just you know, just various wee things. You know, uh, variant cover reveals, things like that, just to try and keep the interest up during the sort of dull spell, uh, which I th- yeah, as I say, we're just kind of getting towards. I think we've got nine days left, so. But in a couple of days' time, I can start sort of ramping up the promotion again, saying, you know, oh, it's the last week to back and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and hope that, uh, you know, there's, there's usually a wee bit of a spike towards the end of the, the campaign Maybe as well. Maybe it was cross- 60 days. Uh, I, I went the full hog, the 60 days, and it was... 60, yeah. It was absolutely brutal because um, <laughs> it was weird because it, it, it spiked at the start, like you said. There was a genuine... I, I made about half the, the, the goal... About two weeks in, and then there was a stretch, and then it was you know tinkling up very very slightly, and then mm-hmm. um, I actually hit my funding goal about three weeks left to go, but it was like mid March, which was yeah. with, when the school started shutting down, and then I had one I had one withdrawal that brought me underneath the under the goal again, and then it went back up, and then it sat um, until until that wee bump that you get towards the end of a Kickstarter. My um, I sat at four. My my target was four hundred, and I sat on four hundred three for about Oof. two and a half weeks, and it was just that like. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> it was, um, and actually, uh, I got quite, a, I got quite a good bump at the end. Um, and uh, but I uh, uh, just quite. Uh, yeah. It can um, be really nerve wracking, and and you're sitting there racking your brains, going. And this is the thing. This is the big challenge for me now. Having done eight Kickstarters and built a wee bit of a following. Uh, for for the stuff that I do, it's trying to get past that, you know. Not not to disrespect the people who back my stuff, I love them, you know. Obviously, I do, uh, and I, I you know, I'm enormously appreciative of the support. But it's like, how do I get to that? To, there must be if two hundred people like this, then there must be two thousand people that like it. I just can't get to them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'm just how do I get to them? How do I get past this wee bubble of people who've heard of me? And uh, and and get the and get the word out a bit further, and that frustrates me no end because I've literally tried. You know, I've I've tried everything I can think of, uh, and I'm yet to hear uh, anybody with with really you know like sort of uh, magic wand advice on on how to do. It. I think it's just perseverance and just gradually building up the audience. But that, that that whole that always seems to happen. You hit goal or you hit a stretch goal target. You announce. Yay, everybody's getting, you know, hey, we've been funded, or hey, we've, uh, everybody gets their stretch goal rewards, and then there's always a cancellation that takes you under. 
before you go back up again. <laughs> There's always somebody who just goes, "Oh, they've made enough money. I don't need, I, you know, I don't need back this anymore." And uh, <laughs> always, see, always seems to be the way. It's so frustrating sometimes. But, uh, you do, but you do always have some really nice packages, uh, reward packages. I'll just show off my badges here. Yeah, badges, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've got uh, an Alex uh, automatic uh, and a uh, Adolf one there as well. That's right. And and you do manage to get a uh, lots of cool artists. In fact, that's a that's Frank Quitely. That's a Frank Quitely, yeah. Aye. That's yeah. just not really. I mean, it just happens that, that Ian and I have, have been quite friendly with uh, with Vinny for a, a long time. So mm -hmm. uh, we cashed in our uh, our, uh, our our friendship chip uh, <laughs> and, uh, and got him to do a cover for the Edge Off. So when that was that, that was probably the, the the most I've ever sort of blown up the internet when I when I revealed that cover. Because we got literally hundreds of retweets and and thousands of likes on that, so that that, that that got us a lot of attention, and that that campaign did really well, obviously, because uh, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm our comic was good, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, I'm I'm pretty happy with the comic, but I'm I'm not stupid enough to pretend that the Frank Quietly cover did not help a, a great deal, <laughs> mm. as you know, as, uh, we've always managed to get really good people to do to do covers for us. Uh, on our campaigns, we've got Martin Simmons and, and John Pearson doing covers for the House of Sweets one. We've got Victor Santos and uh, Warwick Johnson Codwell doing covers for, uh, you know, covers for the, the Alex Automatic one. Uh, and we've had, you know, people like uh, Nick Batara, Ian Laurie doing covers for us in the past. Uh, you know, uh, David Rubin, who's uh, obviously having a, a runaway success on Kickstarter just now with. Uh, uh, Jeff Lemire and Mark Kent for mm -hmm. uh, that detective, uh, which they, they they announced and was instantly funded in like milliseconds, you know, yeah. as you would imagine. Uh, so that's uh, you know we, we've been dead lucky with that. And to be honest, most of that, some of that's me, but most of that is James uh, for the Alex automatic ones at least, uh, because Alex uh, James has been friendly with uh, Warren Johnson Codwell for a long time. He's kind of friendly with David Rubin. He's kind of friendly with Shaky Kane. Uh, and people are all sort of, you know, kind of mutual admiration society on Instagram, I think. So uh, we've managed to get a few of those guys in, uh, you know, just, you know, just purely by, uh, by by James being kind of friendly with them, you know. Uh, but, you know, so we're not the only ones to get, to, to get you know, Legends doing covers for them, uh, Colin. Uh, so if, if, uh, you know, Ian uh, Kennedy did years, have you know it? I've had Ian uh, twice now. Yes, as, exactly. as, yeah, for covers. Yeah, he's awesome. That's as the good one as it for, gets. The one for, really, uh, the one for your that, uh, that war one as well. Yeah, the, the, the your latest one. I think uh, he's you know he's the it's, uh, the quintessential commando cover artist. So. Oh goodness, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And uh, everybody that saw it was kind of blown away. Do you not tell me, Colin, that yeah. somebody came and spoke to you and suggested that it was better, it was one of the better Ian Kennedy covers, you know, it was better than some of the um, Commando stuff he'd put out in the last couple of years? Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, when we were, I was at that um, British Comics event and uh, I had a little preview of it with me. Sorry, and, guys, um, I'm just moving this because I need to plug it right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, that was one of the comments from somebody there. Was that it's just like an amazing cover? It's just one of his best bits right. of output in a while. Yes, it's it's, it's, a, it's really tremendous. Uh, really nice. You're getting my I'm doing my sort of BBC News, uh, you know, bookshelf thing in the background. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, you're, get, you're getting a bit of that. I know, I'm just All right. To, you're just a, you're to, one of those bookshelf wankers. The, the, the iPad there because it's uh, rapidly <laughs> uh, doing the podcast. Really. It kills the battery. Hmm? Okay. Can I segue to beer very, very slightly just because I've had a friend message me asking if I'm drinking Vimto. Um, I think he's trying to just <laughs> laugh at me a little bit. Um, I, I bought this from a... This is Broken Dreams by Siren. I got as a... There's a camera there. Um, uh, I got this on um, a, a, a voucher for Honest Brew, which do... Um, um, just get, They do premium... Their whole thing is that they do premium... Uh, beers in a craft beer at um, like sort of nicer prices um <laughs> i think they, i think they, i think i think they go directly to the brewer and then they they share the the saving onto onto the, the customer 
It's just really good. I've never had a siren before, and it's and uh, it's a broken. It's got it's a breakfast stout, but it's got loads of chocolate in it. It's really nice, Colin. <laughs> I'll maybe check that out when I can get to a beer shop. <laughs> yeah. it might so a lot be of places are doing deliveries now. A lot of the breweries are doing deliveries. Oh, they are, yeah. And um, I just heard that one of the first breweries that we visited uh, was the Brew Shed at Lime Kilns, and um, just a one man band. Um, really nice set of beers, but they've just gotten the license for doing deliveries, so I'll maybe give, give them tomorrow. a chaps in. Yeah. yeah, really, really good prices as well. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously, we benefit from the fact that we're quite local as well in terms of postage and packaging. So, yeah. so I'm getting to drink basically whatever my whatever my wife brings me back <laughs> uh, from the from the shots because I'm 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 not allowed out, unfortunately. Um, so I'm not even. Do, do you have many breweries up. around your area? Or little no, no, kind I of don't think so. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not thinking. There's, you know, Falkirk, there's Falkirk, uh, I mean, a, a hotbed of uh, microbreweries. I, 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 so. I can't say. There might be one or two. Many. You've got you know. Trist out in Larbert. I think that's Trist. relatively oh, yeah. low. Trist are great, and they're doing deliveries just now. They're doing, actually, I'm quite excited. I'm waiting for payday. But they're doing a, they've got um, a porter that I rated very, very highly last year. Um, they're doing that in a mini keg. So if you get five litres of that, <laughs> For for twenty two well, pounds, that's so not bad. Oh, actually, the thing is, if I start all the eggs, then uh, you know my wife's getting seriously concerned about my intake mm. uh, because I do. I don't know if uh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know if this is uh, if this is somebody anybody's. Uh, well, I've seen a few folk talking about this, but I am actually drinking more uh, because just you know, just shoot, just out of sheer boredom. To be, to be honest, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm having a beer almost every night now, and I was yeah. off the beer for a bit again for health reasons, um, yeah. um, and but I'm kind of maybe having one a night, which I'm is not, not really something I would normally do. Having one or two wee stubbies, uh -huh. uh, yeah. when I'm watching a movie, but because I'm stuck indoors, because I, I don't smoke anymore, uh, there's there's very little there's very little sensory pleasure in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Aye, so if I if I have a wee lag well, while I'm watching the telly, then uh, I don't really, uh, I don't think that's all that bad. But uh, yeah. and and when I say I'm drinking more, I mean I'm drinking s something. Usually mm. during the week, I'd be uh, so tired from work that the idea of having a beer uh, in a school night mm. would be abhorrent to me. But uh, because I've uh, actually experienced some. Uh, some rest and downtime in the last few years, uh, the last few weeks, sorry, and uh, you know I'm managing one or two. I might be going, I might be going through a, t a box of twelve a week. Uh, so you know I don't think we have to phone anybody up quite yet. Well, that's, that, that would be that keg. <laughs> that's roughly that's roughly one of these mini kegs. Is it really? Yeah. Right. So for five, five, five liters is about well that's that's a wee can. That's three hundred and thirty. I think the bigger cans are normally. A well, pint's five hundred and sixty-ish milliliters. Is that right, Colin? Yep. Yeah. So it's just under. It's it's about eleven pints a keg. Fair enough. Uh... I think it's less than that. <laughs> actually, too. Um, I'll certainly go. I'll certainly have a look. What they call the game? Yeah, they're called Trist, but with uh, T R Y S T. The root. Now they're they're really good. Um, ah. We um we went to we went to a beer festival about this time last year actually, um and they had a they had a. a they had this choc double chocolate porter on tap there, and that was it was my beer of that festival. It was great. So the fact that you can now get on uh, yeah. um, Can I um, also? Well, um, we're on this. Uh, um, can I? Can we talk a wee bit about sleeping dogs? Just because um, I read it, I, I read it very recently, and it's probably one of my favourite comics this year so far. It, that I've read. I know it's been out for a number of years. It's been out for what five years. But, um, That's right. Yeah, I was uh, yeah. twenty fifteen November twenty fifteen. It came out. Aye. Yeah. I I read yes, it recently. Uh, I really enjoyed it. But um, having just published my first comic, um, or not published, I, I, I'm getting a box from uh, my my printer tomorrow. Uh, oh, yeah. But having ha, ha, having fired everything, but having fired, I know how much I put into this first issue because it is my first comic. Um, mm -hmm. I felt I read I read the Alex Automatics that I had access to, and I had um I read Sleeping Dogs, and I, I I felt there was a much more personal story in Sleeping Dogs. It seemed to be right. tackling. Um, this is just my opinion, I suppose, but um, I felt it was tackling. It tackled loads of different um, uh, different themes and uh, 
based on um based on, when, when, as soon as Colin said that we were going to have you on the show, I was like, oh, I need to ask you about sleeping dogs because I really enjoyed it. Um, I, certainly towards a so I reread it again last night. Just to, um, I just thought I just wanted to ask you about what 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 where the story came from and how you because as I said, there's there's so much in it. There's you know it, it touches on a number of themes about mm. you know, family and. Um, society and uh, just crime. It was just yeah. That, that, I just wanted to know where it all kind of came from. Well, it kind of came from the idea that the basic idea with that one was uh, I came back from uh, me and my pals all went to New York Comic Con in 2014, and Ian and uh, Ian Laurie and John Lees, who who I went with. Uh, part of the group that I went with had, uh, and then Emily was going out, and uh, I met, say, you know, their publishers and uh, a lot of people, and we ended up at a few sort of, uh, sort of comic book events and stuff like that. And I was looking at, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm kind of really jealous of these guys making comics. I'm, I really want to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make one. And so I came back with a kind of burning desire to make a comic, and the idea was. Uh, really to make something that, that could be a one shot and I was trying to think of something that would that would be impactful. So I I, I had in my mind a kind of John Carpenter style, you know, crime thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and then, you know, it just sort of gradually built from there. My stuff's always been kinda of influenced by because I'm a bit older and I grew up in like the seventies and the eighties. Uh my stuff, my stuff's always been like kind of influenced by like Alan Bleasdale and and Dennis Potter and people like that, and uh, and you know, so we used to stuff that you don't really see anymore, which is like really quite hard hitting and uh, unflinching drama yeah. uh, that you really only get now from the likes of like a a special series once a year from Jimmy McGovern or somebody like that. Uh, you don't, you used to see that every week. When I was a mm. kid, Boys, Boys for the Black mm. stuff was one of the biggest shows on TV, and it was a really hard hitting look at what working class life was like, and that kind of stuff is really in my writing DNA. So I really wanted to, and, and just stuff like Ken Loach's mo- early movies and stuff like that. I wanted to make something that was basically like a like a like a John Carpenter movie, but meets Rain and Stones or, or meets Boys for the Black stuff. Something that's got a bit of social realism about it. About yeah. you know because obviously I'm I'm no American, uh, so I can't really realistically depict what life is like in an American suburb. But I can depict what it was like in a in a tenement area in Glasgow or a or a, or a high rise in Glasgow because I'm you know that's that's the stock I'm from. So that was that was that was where it came from. And I wrote the, I wrote the draft and I. I thought I, I yeah I, I quite liked it but I had literally no idea whether it was any good or not at at all I, I had very little confidence in my writing at that time and I gave the draft to Ian and I gave the draft to John Lees and they both came back to me really really positively and they gave me a few notes and helped me out with that but really their main contribution was giving me the confidence to then take it to the next step which was uh, which was looking for the artist, uh, and I went through loads and loads of requests to people who were either too busy or uh, you know weren't interested or or couldn't work for the rates that I was able to offer, which wasn't a great deal. Uh, uh, although you know, although looking at publishers' rates these days, it wasn't that bad either. Mm-hmm. Uh, and eventually, uh, I was coming home for a night out with Ian Laurie. Uh, and we're sitting in the train together, and he's like, hey, "I'm just sort of lamenting the fact that I didn't, I didn't have anybody to draw this comic." And uh, and he was looking, "Oh, well, what about this guy? He's just started following me on on Facebook, and he showed me Lotaro's work. Can we got in touch?" And it and just kind of worked from there. And uh, again, you know, was going back to what Colin was saying earlier about working with David and Colin, a new Colin. Uh, and so I asked him if he would do the letter, which he which he did. And then I was looking at, well, do you know any colorists? And he's going, yeah, I know this guy David Cooper. He's really good. And that, that that's basically how. Yeah, I was like, right, okay. Well, if you say he's good, I'll I'll take your word for it because I know you're good, you know. Yeah. And I was just lucky. 
just damn lucky uh, to get somebody as good as Letaro for the, for the rate that I got him at, uh, and to get Colin and 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 to get and by, and via Colin to get David, who are all you know top guys, just dead lucky. And uh, and again because of Ian and because of uh, the sort of friendships I've developed through Ian, I was able to get Joe Mulvey and Nick Patara to do variant covers as well as Ian and. Uh, and it all kind of all kind of stemmed from there. We went down to Thought Bubble. John Lees, who again I owe such a lot to. Uh, I don't know where I would be today if he hadn't said to me because I had again just zero confidence. Uh, if he hadn't said to me, "Come to Thought Bubble and share my table," I would never. I would never have had the balls to. Uh, I would now, but then I would never have had the balls to even ask for a table for myself. You know, especially you know, with one comic and I'm like, oh, what am I doing there, you know? <laughs> with all these actual comic creators. Uh I would never have had the balls to do it. But John basically made me do it. And uh yeah. So that made that that made a huge difference to me. So just really uh you know the the, the sort of main takeaway for me for, from Sleeping Dogs was uh you know just what a tremendous uh, circle of support that I had and, and how lucky I was with all the people that I managed to that I managed to work with. But in terms of in terms of the themes and stuff like that and stuff that you stuff that you're actually sort of getting at with what I was you know, what I was wanting to do with uh, you know, what kind of story I wanted to tell. I really just wanted to do something that uh, had a bit of that sort of British edge of social realism from the yeah. kind of I think that's something that gives guys my age a wee bit of an advantage over some modern writers. Because we do have that background where that kind of depth is uh, is there, you know. It's, it's, you know, we've we, we've we've got we've all got that stuff pretty much rattling around our heads, you know. All the, you know, we've all seen threads and we've all seen boys through the black stuff and 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 case and stuff like that. And uh, and you know, I think a, a lot of more modern writers haven't 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 really grown up watching absolutely sorrowful unflinching stuff <laughs> about the human condition and about yeah. what it's like to be working class in Britain. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's all just in there, I think. I don't know if Colin, yeah, I'm Colin, I know you're, you're, a bit, you're a bit younger than me, Colin. We're about not far off the same age, yeah. Ah, so, so I don't know if, if you've got any thoughts on that yourself. Mate. No, I, th I think you're right. All the shows that you've mentioned are all stuff that I remember and remember people talking about mm. a lot. You know whether it was at school or, or you know, friends, family talked about those shows because they were so hard hitting. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, like you were saying, you don't really get quite so many shows like that. You know, that once in a, once well, a year that. or I something. Mean, it just was. Yeah. Uh, it was what was on the telly. I mean, it was. Yeah. Uh, and I yeah. really watched it because again, uh, when I was a kid, you had three channels or latterly four channels. Uh, I mean, I was an adult, but it had five channels. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, there wasn't a great deal of choice. If you didn't like what was on ITV, you were watching what was on BBC One. Most of the time, I mean, if my if my dad ever turned over to BBC Two, then things were really bad, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and you maybe you maybe saw like a David Attenborough documentary or something, but uh, but yeah, generally speaking, it was what was ever on one or other. Uh, and even the comedy, even the comedy had an edge to it. Even the comedy like Citizen Smith and. Uh, likely lads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it was all, you know, although it wasn't all by working class people, it, a lot of it was about working class people. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, and you know, again, even stuff like uh, uh, only fools and horses and stuff like that mm -hmm. was, you know, again, it was about working class people try to try to get by. You know, it's a lot of pathos in these shows that uh, I think the next couple of decades were a bit glossier. You know, mm, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm not saying there weren't any hard hitting dramas or where, but they were a bit slicker and glossier than the kind of stuff that we saw, which was a bit raw. Yeah, more. I think British TV started to emulate American TV, uh, <laughs> you know, in the 80s, yeah, to its detriment. And you could say the same a wee bit about the comics as well, especially mm. Britain, uh, stuff like 2000 AD and even stuff like action. And stuff like that, you know. The, the, you know, I had to obviously the famous band cover of the the, the riot. Yes, yeah. so I've seen band cover and stuff like that. So uh, they were, they were so. trying to sneak. They were trying to sneak realism. I mean, you know, so 
people that Johnny Agreed. Wagner and Grant and mm. guys like that were trying to sneak realism into Judge Dredd's, you know, mm. you know, vague, you know, not even, not even very subtle allegories of what was going on in uh, <laughs> in, in, in Britain and around the world and in, in, in these comics. They were a wee bit sort of less slick and more hard hitting and. Uh, than the American comics, and you had Deadline and stuff like Crisis and stuff like that, which were all had a wee sort of political edge to them as well. They all went quiet at the same time. It, 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 it <laughs> did. We're all, just think, we're all just thinking about all these amazing points that we're making. We are. We absolutely are. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping Dogs, I have to say, Fraser, was probably one of the first um, indie comics that I picked up because. I didn't. Oh, okay. Although I read comics as as a sort of youngster and in, in my teenage years, I was a from sort of starting work for many many years up until sort of 2014, 2015, I didn't look at comics at all, apart from the odd mm. fairly big one at the time. You know, if there was someone fairly big at the time, um, and I I went to I can't even remember what comic con it was probably Glasgow or something. I, I remember getting Sleeping Dogs from you and. Uh, I think, uh, and Emily was gone from John and that, um, and just being totally eyes opened to this whole comic scene that I never knew about. Oh, that's um, cool. So uh, I suppose a little thank you there for opening my eyes. Oh, I don't, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure if it hadn't been me, it would have been somebody else. But uh, well, yeah, I was when I was reading it. It was obviously I'd, I'd read the other comic first, but there's um, um sync um which. Colin gave to me last year um, to, to give me the first volume and the second volume came out early towards the end of last year, start of this year I can't quite remember okay. um, I, I, I bought it, uh, I snapped it up and there's a there's a two part um, there's a two part story in that called Graphite Green I think Oh yeah, called. it's fantastic yeah. Um, and uh, Sleeping Dogs very much reminded me of that, obviously the, the setting uh, both kind of set in high rises mm. but uh, 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 schemes yeah um, as, as they would be called uh, back in my day, the scheme. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I it's uh, I it's a fantastic story and a fantastic. I, I love Grant because I, I mean I I know John very well. Yeah. And we're in a writing group together, so I'm I'm very lucky to see his scripts before they ever, mm. uh, you know, before they ever actually get made. So I I remember reading Graphic Green going, "Oh, this is fantastic," mm. and uh, just the character of Dig and the. Uh, I think what he's done with Sync is fantastic. Yeah. To, uh, you know, to to have a to have a, a series where you can dip in and just buy any issue really. Apart from obviously, you need to buy. You know, if you bought one of those two parts, you'd have to buy the other one. But everything yeah. else is really self-contained. However, if you read them all, you start to see uh, a really cleverly constructed bigger picture. Uh, as, uh, as 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 you go along, there's you have some nine, ten, eleven issues that he's done now. Uh, John's uh, John's uh, a really talented writer who's dedicated himself for a long time to 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 uh, to being to being good at what he's doing, and he's, he works really really hard on his craft and stuff like that. And he's already starting to make inroads in the American market. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's a matter of time before he's working on on really really big titles. Yeah. Uh, and and really making a name for himself because he's uh, he's that good. Uh, we, uh, there's a there's a series he's doing uh, for a, a for a, a new publishing company called I think it's AWA they're called. Oh yes, uh, he's doing no tell. Yeah, uh, a horror series, and it's the best horror work that he's done so far. However, yeah. he's got a new thing coming uh, with with uh, with AWA. Uh, which I hope I'm. I hope I'm no uh, breaching any confidences by mentioning, but it's uh, it's a sort of uh, it's basically you know wrestling, uh, American wrestling meets Macbeth. Uh, yeah. It's called the. He's, he's mentioned it in his newsletter, is, so yeah, it's which, out there. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's, well, yeah, he has been talking about it in his newsletter. That's right. But it's stupendous. It's uh, way till you see that. That's gonna. You know, as I say, if if uh, if it gets the kind of attention it deserves, it's going to be a smash hit. So, yeah, really looking forward to uh, yeah, you know, is, is it? Yeah, really looking forward to what what the future holds for John. You know, it's uh, I'm uh, yeah, just sort of lucky lucky to fall in with him at the right time before he get too big <laughs> for me. You know, <laughs> what does the future hold for you? What have you got coming up? 
Well, I've got loads of things coming up. Uh, obviously, the the lockdown has meant after, and uh, the fact that I, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm basically furloughed at the minute. So uh, until uh, my work situation changes, I've got time in my hands at the minute. Uh, although uh, you know, plenty of stuff other than writing to keep me going, but I, I have managed to stockpile loads of stuff. Uh, so obviously, I've got the. The next thing that I have to do is sort out the fulfilment for Alex once all that's done, and that'll take up a bit of time and getting all the all the ins and outs of that sorted out and everything posted out, and, which I think is probably going to be a challenge uh, in lockdown. I was going to actually ask you about how how your uh, posting out uh, is is going for your one, Colin. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so the, the last time I checked with my post office, you had allowed three items at a time. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's changed or if, uh, you know, if uh, they've reinstated drop and go facilities or whatever. But you know, once I get that challenge out of the road, uh, I've got a couple of projects coming up. One with uh, Nori Miller, uh, mm. which is a sort of action, sort of vertigo kind of action comic called Nightmare Fuel, sort of action horror. Nice. Uh, that's... Uh, that he's just he's just kind of he's basically he's finished the roughs for that and just started doing the inks. The pages are, are looking amazing for that. That's basically about a kind of alternate reality where monsters exist. Uh, however, uh, people have uh, figured out how to turn them into a, a, a resource, uh, and it's basically about uh, it, it, it's kind of two stories really that converge. One about the kind of boardroom uh, of the company who. Uh, you know, basically have a patent on turning monsters into various products, including fuel uh, and food additives and, you know, clothing and stuff like that. Basically, it's a kind of uh, avatar for uh, petroleum. And, uh, and it, it, it kind of uh, uh, juxtaposes that story with one of a team of uh, uh, monster hunters who are out actually gathering the raw fuel for this process. Uh, so the story's called Nightmare Fuel from Lenoff. Uh and it's uh, yeah, so as I say, it's a kind of vertigo uh, Warren ellis kind of thing uh, with, you know, which has a, a bit of a kind of environmental message uh, to, to, you know, it's like what if the, you know, what if the veg what if the, what if, what if the, what if the meat could fight back, you know what if the, what if the meat had fangs <laughs> and claws and you know, so that's uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting idea. So we'll see how good, see how that goes. Certainly, the artwork's looking amazing for that so far. Um, really pleased with how the first issue of that's turned out. So that'll be coming hopefully before the end of the year. I'm also doing something with uh, barking creator uh, Lucy Sullivan, uh, who uh, Lucy and I are doing a, a sort of uh, a downbeat kind of dust bowl sci-fi kind of thing. Uh, I guess it's kind of Bradbury meets the the road, uh, kind of a thing called uh, Indexed, uh, which is about a person who wakes up to find that they've been placed on the index, which is a sort of government form of control, uh, where you don't really find out why you've been put on there, but having be- been put on there, you basically become a kind of ghost person. You're not allowed to uh, live with your family. You're not allowed to work. You know, all your bank accounts get. To, uh, you'll get cancelled and everything, so you basically become a, a sort of a, a ghost person overnight, and uh, it's all about this person trying to come to terms with that and trying to find a sort of rumoured community of other people like her, uh, and uh, and what happens as a result of that. Uh, so again, uh, Lucy's well into the sort of planning stages and early artwork on that, and that'll be uh, that'll be coming very soon. As well, uh, what else have we got? A couple of other things. Uh, yeah, I've, I've just uh, finished writing something for Stephen Horry, uh, who is a sort of writer of uh, uh, Lizard Men uh, for Comic House and also uh, the Double D for Image with Thierry Argos and David Cooper, funnily enough. Uh, and that's a, that again, that's a kind of, uh, again, I kind of carpentry one shot about a uh, a guy who turns up in a small sort of idyllic suburban American town 
and just starts ruthlessly murdering everybody he encounters. And so the, the big question is, why is he doing that? Uh, <laughs> and you, you find out the town's not quite what it seems to be. Uh, so there's that, that's in the pipeline. So there's just absolutely loads on the go. There's, there's, there's more that I can't actually remember at this point in time. It's either, Why? It's either, it's it's either half done or... Imagine that. Uh, or we, don't have, we don't have an artist yet. And, you know, just various things at various points are uh, organisation, you know. As always with these things. That's incredible. You're just churning stuff out. Um, yeah. on, on that point of producing comics, I also want to just kind of say... You know, you you are per, perhaps the only comic creator that I know of that actually has a book about them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's it, uh, uh, Emily. Uh, I'm going to tell us a wee bit uh, about this this, uh, this odd fanzine. <laughs> well, to be fair, this has very little to do with me. And as, uh, <laughs> as Emily just decided she was going to do this, and uh, illustrated some of my tweets. Uh, some of your some legendary of my, tweets some of my so-called funny tweets <laughs> and then uh, uh, you know because I do I, I don't know but I, I think you know there's quite a lot of negativity on Twitter so I do sometimes try and stick up a few jokes just to try and uh, yeah <laughs> <Friendly>. <laughs> uh, just to try and sort of uh, I don't know de- yeah, just sort of detoxify the timeline a wee bit but uh, <laughs> But Emily's, uh, Emily uh, pulled a bunch of those and, uh, and illustrated them and, and sort of told me about it afterwards and she said, well, I, I hope this is okay. And I was like, yeah, of course it is. That's absolutely fine. Uh, and she made that up for her uh, her label, uh, Happy Clam, uh, where she makes her comics with uh, her partner, the, the excellent Gavin Mitchell as well. The two of them make uh, terrific comics together. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I'm quite, I'm quite, <laughs> quite honoured uh, and uh, and happy with that. You can't really argue with that. If somebody uh, goes to the bother of doing that, and uh, that was uh, yeah, quite a privilege, I suppose. Well, so. okay, I guess kind of on that kind of happy, irreverent note, we we'll just we should say follow Fraser for irreverent tweets. Yeah, hey, what's your um, what's your uh, what's your Twitter handle? It's uh, at C 9 And in case anybody thinks that's me being saucy, that was actually just the year I was born. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to be suggestive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so there we go. C six nine. Yeah, you'll get me there uh, for uh, at the minute. Pretty much relentless uh, Alex Automatic uh, <laughs> advertising. <laughs> But the occasional, the occasional wee <laughs> joke or, or, or rant about politics or whatever, and then whatever happens. Uh, but yeah, I do spend a lot of time, probably more time on there at the moment than, than normal because obviously we're all we're all home more than we uh, more than we normally are. Eh? Any, any last that, things? Like, yeah. I was going to say for the for the sign of um, if 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 you're putting some irrelevant sort of trying to break up the newsfeed. I've, I've spent, obviously, for similar reasons, uh, quite a lot of time on Twitter recently, and it's not the happiest place in the world at the moment. So, um, no, it's not, is it? Just a wee bit nicer, that's that's not a bad thing. Well, I do, I do try. Uh, I don't always succeed. I sometimes find myself deleting ang- really angry tweets, <laughs> spiky tweets. Sometimes <laughs> I just leave them up there. And sometimes I'm just like, do you know what? I'm just no fucking, I'm just no, you know, adding to this today and just delete them. Uh, because sometimes you just need to tweet it to get it off your chest. It's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like I don't know if you guys watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but they've got this thing where it's called a scream pillow, where if they're really angry, they scream into a pillow, uh, and it's kind of like that, or, or just shouting at the window. Uh, but you know, you can do it quietly so nobody thinks you're insane. That's kind of like what a lot of people treat Twitter for. You know, it's like a way, you know somebody mm. they absolutely rant and rave, uh, which is fine. You know, you do you and all that. But uh, and I can't say that I have never done that. I've done it loads, uh, but just sometimes I'm looking at, oh, uh, I maybe shouldn't make this any worse. <laughs> uh, and, and I try my best to uh, to keep it light, or maybe not keep it light, but to at least keep it positive. Yeah. Uh, uh, not always succeeding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the on this is on the the effort, though. I think that's. The fact that you're trying is the important thing. Oh, we're all trying, mate. We're all trying. 
<laughs> well, thanks, Fraser. I think we'll kind of call it a, a, a night there, let you get back to all your writing. <laughs> you seem to have an awful <laughs> lot on your plate. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've, 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 honestly, I've, I've not done anything all week because I'm, I'm literally... <laughs> I'm literally, I'm, I've got stuff mapped out for like two years now. If, uh, you know, if I don't get a publisher to pick anything up, if I'm putting all this stuff out myself, I am very busy for a long time. But uh, what else would I be doing with my spare time, you know? I'm not a, I'm not a wash the car, mow the lawn kind of guy, so... No, me it's, neither. <laughs> it's, it's this or I'm just sitting about watching movies or football or something, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, right, well, oh, oh, we could, we'll just kind of leave it there, but thank you very much for coming along, Fraser, yeah. and uh, chatting with us, telling us about your comics and uh, your plans for the future and how you're coping with lockdown as well. Oh, my boy. Oh, pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> All yeah. right. So, cheers, and uh, I don't know what we've got planned for next week, folks, but uh, we uh, might I, have I, another I, guest. Oh, you know. I know, but it's a secret. I've got, I've, I've got us sorted for next week. Oh, <laughs> but it's a secret. Yeah, well, it is just now, so I can oh. just make sure that that's the case. Because um, oh, okay. I might have to, um, I've just confirmed something in the last, well, just before we went to air. But you know, just in case they pull out, I might need to go and find somebody else. Oh. Pretend that, that was the plan originally. So. Oh, we'll have Fraser back next week then. If oh, there we <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you can substitute. <laughs> yeah, welcome in time, man. Yeah, what's well, that? Basically, if, if the if the good thing that they don't have lined up uh, uh, pulls out, they'll, they'll they'll have me. And yeah, you could just live tweet. You could live fingers, tweet during the show. Yeah, and um, everybody, the, the good thing that they've got lined up, uh, you know, <laughs> it happens. You know, so last and thing it, you want is putting back going. Well, it, it, <laughs> we're going to have to try and wait to edit the last thirty-seven seconds of the podcast out because if my 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 thing doesn't pan out, I'm going to have to pretend that you were the plan all along. So, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> until then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, so until we see you again. Cheers. Cheers, lads.